we're in week three of a series called The Comparison Trap. And week one, a couple weeks ago, we, did, we kind of admitted something that was pretty hard to say. And here's kind of what we admitted. We said, comparison is a trap that robs our joy and ruins our relationships. And here's the thing, listen, it feels weird to say that comparison is a trap, right? Because that feels weird, it feels wrong because comparison, if we're all honest, if I'm honest, if you're honest, if we're honest, comparison comes really easy, doesn't it? It's like comparison comes naturally. Comparison is something that we almost do every day, all the time, every day. It feels so natural, but it robs our joy and ruins our relationships. And here's why it does that. Because comparison leads to behaviors that harm ourselves. Another matter of fact, week one, here's what we discovered. Comparison leads to competing. We go from, listen, I'm a friend that's for you to you're an enemy that needs to be beaten. And, and last week we kind of talked about this and we said, listen, listen, greatness doesn't come from beating people. Greatness comes from how we love people. And when you love people, you can celebrate them. And that comparison leads to coveting. Listen, I see what they have, so I want, I deserve, I need, I wish. And then it leads to complaining. I mean, Americans could have a gold medal and complaining, it's never enough, I'm not satisfied, I just want more, right? And then it leads to chasing, like, listen, listen, vanity, I want people to see me, I want people to know me, I want the applause of people around me. And the problem is we seek the applause of people that may not even truly care about us. And so this week we're going to talk a little bit about coveting. Last week we talked about competing. Now listen, here, here's the thing. Listen, this is, going to be, this is going to be fun this week because listen, here's what I've discovered. No one ever likes to admit that they covet. Right? Come on. Like, like no, one, no, one, no one agrees with me, right? Okay, like listen, come on, listen. Now everyone goes, listen, I've been mad before. Yeah, I get mad. And people go, yeah, I've been jealous. But no one ever goes, yeah, man, I covet a lot. Like, man, that's, that's what I do. And, and so listen, I, it's gonna be a little bit hard. It's gonna be a little bit uncomfortable. But here's the thing. I think it's something that I probably struggle with. You probably struggle with. It's probably something that we've all struggled with. But when we kind of talk about coveting, we need to know, well, what, is, what does coveting really mean? And so I wanna put a definition up. So as we're kind of walking through the rest of the message, you'll understand. And covet is to desire wrongfully. It means we desire something that isn't good for us, that isn't right, that will actually harm us. Sometimes we desire the wrong thing. And, and this happens because your greatest regrets, and we'll get to this a little bit later, you got what you wanted. And so sometimes we desire wrongfully or we desire without due regard to the rights of others. We desire something, but we'll step over people to get it. And I've often been asked as a pastor, Matt, what's the difference between coveting and kind of greed, lust, and envy? And I will say greed, lust, and envy, they're all coveting. They're just coveting specific things. Like when you covet money or you covet possessions, that's, that's, that's greed. When we say, oh, I wish I had their bank account. I wish I had their car. I wish I had, that is greed. When you covet someone sexually or physically, you lusting after somebody, that's where we get the word lust. And when you covet someone's position, I wish I had their job. I wish I had the promotion. I wish I was in their place. You are envying their position or their role in life. And so really greed, lust, and envy are all just forms of coveting. And it's where we desire without the regard to the rights of others. Here's the thing about coveting. When I think about my life, some of my biggest and greatest mistakes and regrets come from coveting. Matter of fact, one of my most embarrassing stories in life that, that I've probably shared before, but when I share it, it's, it's just embarrassing and it's shameful, um, but it all happened and started because I coveted. I was about 11 or 12 years old. I had moved into this brand new neighborhood. Um, my, my biological dad and my stepmom, we had lived in an apartment complex and we moved to this new housing development. We, we lived in a townhouse and, and this was kind of a planned community. It was one of the first planned communities in this area. Um, and I was new to the area. Most of these people had grown up in kind of this area. They knew each other. I was the new kid on the block. I didn't know anyone. Plus I was a little bit awkward and I didn't know how to make friends. I wasn't really good at it. And so I showed up in this neighborhood and I had zero friends. I didn't know anybody, um, but I met this kid on the tennis court and he became my friend and, and we would play tennis together and he would invite me over to his house and, and he had a nicer house than ours and it was beautifully decorated. And he had his original mom and dad and, and he had a sister and she was cute and he had an older brother who was like athletic and awesome and he was cool and they had something else that was really awesome. They had an Atari. Man, we used to play Pong. Does anybody remember? No one knows what Pong is. I, apparently this is the young audience right here. There used to be before video games came out, it was called Pong and that's literally like ping pong. They had a ball on the screen. I can remember going, man, he's got this thing called Pong. Like if I could be somebody, I'd want to be like my friend. And, and he took me to his room and showed me all this cool stuff and we'd hang out. And, and he showed me that like he had this stack of cash that he'd get for birthday presents, stuff like that. And because I coveted and I wanted and I wish I had what he had, I, I stole some of his money. And eventually he found out and his mom and dad found out and, and the relationship was ruined, but it all happened because I coveted. 
And it got me thinking, I wonder if I'm the only person that's ever like ended up somewhere they didn't want to be because they coveted. Maybe it was wealth. Maybe it was a person. Maybe it was a position. And it got me thinking, how, how do, like, like, I look at you guys, you guys are so like handsome and beautiful and good and like, how do normal people end up at a place that they don't want to be in? And so I thought about this and here's how we end up here. See if this has ever happened to you. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And when in coveting, here's what happened. Coveting is we see, aren't you glad you can see? God gave us the gift of seeing we have eyes. But if we are really honest in today's society, we get marketed with Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook and all of our marketing, everything is thrown in front of us. We see things that are beautiful and nice and wonderful. We see everyone's best. No one ever puts out their junk. So we see, right? And then we see and we go, listen, I want that. Or, oh, that's beautiful. We, you know, we see this, see this car and we go, oh man, that, I just saw, you know, one of those Corvettes that was convertible. It was awesome. It was pretty. Or you see someone's house or you see someone's husband or wife and you go, oh wow, you know, I wish I had that. You, you know, you see and then you admire beauty. And, and in these first, two se- these first two sections, there's really nothing wrong because you were meant to see. And listen, there's nothing wrong with admitting that something or someone is beautiful. The problem is we start to cross this line. I call it the stare. Listen, I work out of gym and there's way too many people that stare. I'm like, hey man, bro, you should stop that, right? Like, you know, just stop staring. Like, it's ridiculous. But I mean, isn't that what we do? We see, we think it's beautiful or admire it, whether it's a position, whether it's a person, whether it's a thing. And then all of a sudden we stare at it. It might be a person. It might be a house, and all of a sudden, the next thing we're on, we're on like all on the internet, and we're looking at it. And, and maybe if it's a car, we start thinking about how we're going to get it. We, we stare at it, and we look at it, and we go, oh, I got to drive by that. I got to walk by that place every day, or, or I got to look at this thing every day. And so we stare at it. And then we begin to plot. Maybe I could just, you know, maybe we could just have a cup of coffee. And, you know, it won't turn anything bad, but I would just like to get to know them better. And, you know, they're married and, you, you know, it's more than a cup of coffee. But you begin to think, what if we had a cup of coffee? What, what if they got divorced? Or, you know, what if the person who has my position got fired? What, what, if, what if I didn't do a good enough job and then I could get their position? You know, what, what if maybe I wanted that thing and, you know, I, I could earn more money, but I have to take some shortcuts. And we, we begin to think of things of way to get this thing that we see, we want, and we've stared at, right? And then eventually we take... And it got me thinking, how is it that like everyday normal good people will go, I see, I want, I stare, I plot, and I take, like, how, how do we do this? Like, you're sharp people. I'm sorry. Like, how, how do we do that? Like, how do we end up there? And then it came to me. Here's how we end up here. I'm going to put the statement up on there. It's unfair. It's unfair that I don't have what I want so I can do whatever it takes. How many of us have ever said that? It's not, why do they get to... Why do they get to have that? Why, why should they be the only one that's happy? Why do they get to have that person? Why do they get to have that car? Why do they have that position? Life's unfair. Life is unjust. And so we begin to make statements like this. It's like, man, li- life isn't fair. The world is unjust. I deserve. I deserve what they have. I deserve the opportunity to have all things have. And so here's what we say. We go, it's unfair that I don't have what I want so I can do whatever it takes to get it. Which is the thing of coveting is is where we take things without regard to other people or things that aren't meant for us. And we get there because in our minds we've gone, it's not fair, I don't have what they have, and therefore since I don't have what they have and it's unfair, I get to do whatever it takes and if it includes hurting them or hurting others to get what it is I want. And it leads us, listen, 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 it doesn't matter whether you have no faith or different faith, or maybe you grew up in church and you're a follower of Jesus. Listen, we've all experienced this. So it leads us to our truth this morning. Matter of fact, if you're following the insert, we're going to put up here on the screen, it's this. Coveting leads to the corrupted thinking that life is all about consuming. Listen, when you and I start to compare and then we start to covet, I want, I see, I'm going to stare, I'm going to plot, right? Coveting leads to the corrupted thinking that life is all about consuming. Listen, when you and I covet, listen, we don't think our value and the value of our life comes from our character. My value and the value of my life doesn't come from the way that I treat people. When we covet, my value and the value of my life doesn't come from what I contribute, taking what I have that's unique to me and making the world a better place. No, no, no. My value and the value of my life comes from how much I can consume. And the more that I can consume, the more valuable I am and the more valuable my life is because life is all about consuming. And just like in previous weeks, we we fail to ask ourselves a pretty important question. Is our race to consume really going to lead us to the life we want? And here's what's scary. We already know the answer. 
right? I mean, we already know the answer. I know the answer. You know the answer, but the reality is, is that none of us want to actually say the answer out loud. Because listen, listen, I bet this is true. Think about your greatest regret. Think about your greatest mistake. Your greatest mistake and your greatest regret is you got what you wanted. I mean, think about it, think about it, think about it. You finally got with him or her, right? You finally got there and then, whoa, this wasn't what I thought. I had to pay a price and now, now things aren't working out. You, you got that possession, you, you, you went into debt, you did this or you took that and now you got it, now you can't afford it, right? You got this position and you thought it would solve all your problems and now you just have more problems. See, you know and I know because we've all done it before. We've all got something that we've wanted and then went, whoa, the price to get what I wanted was way too high and it didn't deliver what I was hoping it would do. Because whatever it is that we get, it's never, ever enough. I mean, it, come on, come on, right? We go, to, we, go to, we go to high school or middle school and we want to date the right person so we look cool, right? So we can have friends and then we want to have friends and we want to make good enough grades or go to play te team to go to a college. And why do we want to go to college? So that we can hopefully meet our future spouse if we haven't already met them, right? And we want to make good money and then that way we can have a car, we can have a house, we can have a kids. And then when we can have kids, we want to be able to put them through college, like, right? We want to be able to do all this stuff and then we want to be able to send them out and then we want to be able to retire. And it's like, we, we're just never, ever happy. It's just never, ever enough. And so you and I are left asking one of life's most important questions. How do you and I not fall for the trap of coveting? Where our thinking gets corrupted, where we think life is all about consuming. Because if we were honest, the whole world around us believes that life is all about what you have and what you experience. And this is why I love being a follower of Jesus. It's why I wake up before my alarm. You know, Jesus actually addressed this. Listen, listen, God knew that in every generation, on every culture, in every continent, that this would be something that we struggle with. And matter of fact, Jesus addresses this very issue of us falling for the trap of coveting and wanting things, whether it's greed, lust, or envy. Matter of fact, we, we, catch, we catch Jesus encountering this and dealing with this very issue. Matter of fact, we're going to catch it in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke. We're going to put it up on the screen here. Jesus was walking around. And here's the th funny thing. Listen, if you've ever read the Bible for yourself, you should read it, especially the New Testament. There was always a crowd of people around Jesus. See, here's what I've discovered. People don't like religion. People don't like organizations, but people loved Jesus. And see, if the church could ever get back to Jesus, I think the churches would be crowded again, okay? And so here it was, there was a crowd around Jesus and it said, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. So, so this guy's out there and his brother got the inheritance and he didn't, get it, he didn't get all that he thought he was owed. He thought he earned or deserved more. The answer is more. That was a trick question. Right, because look, come on, come on. Isn't that, isn't that how we think life is always, life is always better if we have Right, so, his, so the brother's yelling out in the audience to Jesus, Jesus, my brother got the most inheritance. He hasn't given me everything I need and I think I need more. Can you tell him to share? Jesus answered, man, who made me judge or arbitrator? See, if Jesus is just a good teacher, then he has no right to speak in our life. But if he's God's son, then he doesn't give suggestions, he gives commands. So Jesus goes on and he says this. And he said to them, take care and be on guard. Now listen, this is really, really important. It's so important this morning. Listen, twice Jesus tells the audience, he yells at the crowd, take care. And don't just take care, but be on guard. So two times before Jesus is saying something, he's going, this is so important. You need to get this. So we need to be listening. He says, be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist of the abundance of the possessions. Jesus turns to the audience and he tells them, listen, take careful, be on guard. Listen, you don't understand. Life is not about what you have. This is not a race to see who finishes with the most toys before they die. Life was meant to be so much more than the pleasures you experience or the possessions that you have. Life isn't found in possessions and pleasures. Be on guard because the world and you will believe that if you have and you experience that that's life, but you'll be disappointed. Life isn't in the things that you have or experience. Be on guard. And so this morning, I want to take a look at what Jesus says. I want to take a look at what God says so that none of us fall for the trap thinking that consuming or consumption leads to a fulfilling life. 
Here's observation number one. If you're following, if you're like the type A person, you know, the person that always wants to get the good grades and you have that really neat handwriting and, you know, you're going to follow along and say, hey, it's about observation number one. The fatal flaw of consuming is that it can never fully fill us. You know how I know this? Because you're going to eat later today. Right? Y'all ate yesterday, right? So most of you ate yesterday, right? Some of you ate this morning. And guess what? You're going to eat again tonight. Some of you may eat right after church, right? You ate once, but, but it wasn't enough. True story. <clears throat> when I was just out of high school, I had, a, I had an uncle and he owned a house near the beach. And so I had five or six friends who all went to the same church that I went to. And we said, hey, let's, you know, let's, it's the summertime. Let's go to the beach. We have a free place to stay. And so we went down to my uncle. There was like six of us. We stayed at his house. It was awesome. We stayed near the beach and we were there. And my uncle said, listen, listen, listen. If, since you guys are here, you should go to this all you can eat seafood place. It's one of the best places in the air. You'll love it. And I said, well, how much is it? It was like $25.99. And back in the day, $25 was a lot of money. And I said, that's a lot of money. He says, I promise you, they have lobster. They have prime rib. They have crab. Like it's an all you can eat. You should go there. So the six of us got in our car. We drove this place and it was, it was really nice. It was, we were low class people in a high class place, right? Like, but it was okay. I paid my money. I was gonna eat my food, right? So there we are and you can look out. It was over the water. It was really pretty. And it had this amazing buffet of like lobster and steak and crab. And since I paid, I was gonna eat till they, they dragged me out of that place or I popped one of the two. So I ate as much food as I could. I ate as much food as I could. Matter of fact, a whole group of us ate food. And the plan was to go to this all-you-can-eat place and then go, then go like go onto the boardwalk where we could see the water and the waves and see all the fun stuff and maybe ride some rides and have some fun. The problem was four of us were so stuffed that we felt sick. The only thing we could do is we all, we have a, I have a picture of somebody taking us. We all just laid on the ground and we all moaned with our bellies full on the floor. Oh, we can't do it. Two people went off to do stuff. And I was like, man, I ruined my evening. But you know what happened the very next day? I ate again. Because it wasn't, because we always want. Now, at South Point, we talk about real life issues and we talk about big people stuff. So if you have little children, you might want to cover the ears, but we're going to talk about a little, come on, listen. Like we know this is true. This is why no one ever stops with one drink. Come, come on, right, come on. Let's not pretend like, oh, no one here would drink. Like, come on. This is why no one stops with one beer. Like this is why people don't have sex just once. Like it's just never, it's just never fully, it's just never enough. It's why you never just buy one thing. Like, you know, some of you may have like a collection of like a hundred pairs. It's just never enough. You can never eat enough, have enough, buy enough, have enough money, shop enough, shoot a low enough score in golf. You always want to beat it. You can win, but you want to win again. And here's what you know. The fatal flaw of consuming is it never fully fills us. We always want. We always come back because it doesn't fill us. And here's the thing, you already knew this and I knew this, but God's been telling us this. Matter of fact, I love what the scripture says. We're going to see this in Ecclesiastes. It says there was a man all alone. And the point is there's this guy, he had nobody to be responsible for. So his bills were small, right? He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. What he means is, listen, he didn't have to care for anybody. He was just piling a big, big pile of cash for himself because he was never satisfied. He said, for whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. We know it. We consume, we think it's gonna fill us, and it does for a second. That new thing that we bought, oh yeah, I like this. I mean, if you don't believe me, just why do you have like an iPhone 10? You'd still have the original iPhone, like, right? It's just never enough. Matter of fact, the same author, King Solomon says this in Proverbs. He says, just as death and destruction are never satisfied, so human desire is never satisfied. <clears throat> and here's why. Here's why we can never consume our way to fulfillment. It's because we were made for something more. See, you and I were made for purpose, not for consumption. See, here's what I discovered. Consuming is the side effect of God's goodness of giving us purpose. See, we're meant for purpose. And as a benefit and a side effect, God allows us to consume. I mean, God gave us taste buds so we could experience chocolate and bacon. Yes. Amen. We could end the service right now. Right? 
God gives us the ability to consume because he's good, but you and I aren't made to consume. You and I are made for a purpose, which leads me straight into observation number two if you're following along, and it's this. It says, we can replace the addiction of consuming with the adventure of a calling. Listen, listen, here's what I've discovered in life. Everything and almost everything is addicting. That most of us think of addiction just for people with drugs or just people with people with alcohol, but really you can be addicted to food, you can be addicted to shopping, you can be addicted to Fortnite, you can be addicted to all your habits, your hobbies. Like you can be addicted to anything, you can be addicted to shopping. I mean, you just, there's all kinds of things that you can be addicted to. And if we think life comes from consuming, but consuming never fills us, the only thing we can do is keep consuming more and more and more. So we get stuck in a cycle of consuming, whether it be drugs or alcohol or sex or shopping or money or sports or whatever it is. We get stuck in the cycle. And here's what I discovered about addiction. You don't stop addiction, you have to replace an addiction. And see, God didn't mean for us to be addicted to consuming. He calls us to an adventure. Matter of fact, we see this in Jesus in the opening chapters of Mark. Jesus shows up on the scene and says, listen, we're doing life wrong. The reason the world is busted and broken is because we all think life comes from what we have and what we experience. And Jesus shows up and he's walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Going on, he says, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Now, the thing about Mark is Mark tells the condensed version and Luke, Luke gives the whole version. The fishermen were out fishing, but they hadn't caught anything. And so Jesus yells out to the fishermen. He says, hey, have you caught any fish? And they go, no. And he says, well, throw your net on the other side. They throw their nets on the other side and they start catching so many fish. This is ridiculous. Their boat starts to sink. So they call over a friend's boat and say, help us catch. And they catch so many fish, their boat begins to sink. And as they get ashore, they realize there's something unique about Jesus. He's not just some normal guy. They've, they've been lifetime fishermen for generations. They realize what a miracle is, is. And Jesus doesn't say, listen, enjoy the fish. Because that's what life is all about. Just consume. Sell some fish and get some stuff. No, Jesus says, come follow me and I will send you to fish for people. See, here's the truth about life. Fulfillment doesn't come from what? Fulfillment doesn't come from what you have. You already know this. You can get the latest and greatest and it is, feels good and it's nice for a little bit until the next latest and greatest thing comes out and then you need to replace it. Fulfillment doesn't come from the pleasures you experience because once you've experienced it, it's over and you want to do it again. Fulfillment doesn't come from what? Fulfillment comes from a who and a why. See, here's the most amazing thing. And, and this is what I think, listen, this, this is, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about organization. I'm not talking about a church. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus. Jesus says, come follow me, have a relationship with me. And then he says, I'll make you fish for people. And here's the most mind boggling, amazing thing is God created us to partner with him and bringing up there down here. This is mind boggling to me that God would use busted and broken and flawed people like me. If you knew how crazy I am, you would say, oh, we shouldn't give him a microphone. <laughs> right? Like, listen, isn't that the most amazing, miraculous thing is that God takes people and when they calls them their son and daughter, calls them into the family. So your value doesn't come from what you have. It comes from who you belong to. It is not your stuff that makes you valuable. It's who you belong to. Your heavenly father calls you as a son or daughter of the most high. And then he calls you to a Why? You were designed for purpose. You weren't meant here just to consume. You were meant to bring heaven down here on earth. You have purpose. Listen, my job is not to change St. Mary's County. That's your job. My job is to teach and to preach and to, and to engage and to give leadership. But each and every one of you has a story that you're meant to, you're to be the hero. And here's what I discovered about the addiction of consuming. You can't just stop stuff. You have to replace it. How do we say no to something? We say no to something so that we can say yes to something better. I mean, changing the world and impacting eternity is a pretty awesome opportunity that God invites us to. And God doesn't invite us to that opportunity because we're talented or because we're good or because we earned it, but because he loves us. And he calls all of us to that. We can substitute our addiction to consume and to consume and to consume with an adventure. 
In the first service, I told a true story. There, there are two people I know. They don't live in this community. They live in different communities. You don't know them. I know them from my past, so I, I don't feel bad telling, telling you this truth in the story. But one of them, one of, these, one of these people that I know, they live in one of the most affluent counties in the country. They live in one, of, I think it's either number one or number two of the wealthiest communities in America. They live in one of the nicest houses in one of the most affluent, nicest communities in America. They drive one of the nicest brand cars that if you saw, you'd be like, oh yeah, that's, that's that. They have everything they want. Whatever they want, they just do. They have people make them food. They, they, they have everything. And here's the thing about this person. They have access to everything that they consume that would make them happy. And yet they're one of the most unhappiest people that I know. Because we all know a truth. We just don't want to admit it. You can't consume your way to fulfillment. Now the flip side is I know someone who used to live in America. They had a really good position and lived in a really nice area in a nice home. They sold their home and moved out of this nice area to move to a different country in poverty to help people. And you know what I discovered about both of these people is they both have problems. They do, they both have, they have problems, they both have issues, they both have families, they both have things that go well and go wrong, but one is fulfilled and one isn't. And I think one has discovered that fulfillment doesn't come from what we have or what we experience, but who we're with and why we're here. Jesus says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of people. You're supposed to be a part of the greatest adventure there is. And you know what we try to settle for? iPhones and video games, and the latest and greatest. And we say, God, why aren't you doing anything to change this busted and broken world? And I believe when we get to heaven, God's gonna look at us and go, why, why, why didn't you do anything? Which leads me to observation number three, which is contentment is the antidote for the poison of coveting. I mean, listen, listen, come on. Like, listen, we're gonna, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna put on our big boy pants and our big girl pants. Like, listen, let's, we all, here's what we know. We know that there's some true principles in life. We know they're true and they're actually very easy and simple. They're just not easy to do. Like, I'm gonna give you some examples. Are you ready? Like, just, just play along with me, right? Like, listen, if you wanna be healthy physically, you need to eat or less and exercise more, right? So it's easy. You should eat better or less and then exercise more. That'll make you healthy, right? If you want to be healthy financially, you need to spend and save. Uh, you can, if you don't want to be greedy, you should be generous and share. Like, like, it's not like, listen, this isn't rocket scientist. You didn't even come to church to know that, that you already have this. Listen, the solution to, to coveting is simple. It's contentment. Well, what is contentment and how do we get this contentment? so we don't fall for the trap of greed, lust, and envy. I love what the scripture says. The apostle Paul, who encountered risen Jesus, I mean, the apostle Paul's a pretty, I mean, his story is amazing. He used to persecute the church. He didn't believe in Jesus. He encountered a risen Jesus. And so he becomes a disciple and follower of Jesus because he's encountered a risen Jesus. And he starts like leading churches and their churches like up, like this. It was a church in Rome that was made up of some Jewish people who'd grown up in church, some heathen people who'd never heard of church and all different kinds of people. There were, there were men, there were women, there were foreign, it was all kinds of people just like this church. And here's what he writes them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, if God is for us, and listen, listen. Some of you go, I've experienced bad. I don't know if God is for me. Listen, anyone that would die for you A God that would die for you is for you. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Now here's the thing I'm gonna say that I don't like to say out loud even to myself. We all believe that God is able to save our souls. But we rarely believe that God is able to meet our needs. Right? I mean, I believe that God can save my soul. He gave his one and only son. I believe in Jesus. I believe he conquered hell and death. His tomb is empty, right? He forgives me, but I don't know if God's gonna meet my needs. And so the reality is, is we just don't trust God. When you and I go, I'm gonna stare, I'm gonna plot, and then I'm gonna take, what we're really saying is, God, I don't trust you to meet my needs. I think it's unfair that I don't have what I want. So I'm gonna go outside the boundaries and I'm gonna do what I wanna do to have what I wanna have. And then when we create a mess, we come to church and go, God, please fix my mess. 
How do I know? Right here. But the reality is, is he wants to graciously give us all things. But listen, I'm a parent. I'm a parent of two kids. You don't give kids everything they want. You know why you don't give kids everything they want? Because sometimes they ask for things that will hurt them. And sometimes they'll ask for things at the wrong time. And sometimes they're not ready to handle things. And so you just don't give your kids everything they want all the time. Because it's not good for them. You don't give a six-year-old a convertible Corvette or a 16-year-old. Maybe when they're 40 and have their own kids. And if you have one of those you want to give away, I will take it. <laughs> just saying, right? But we, all, but we all get that, right? We all get that. But when it comes to our Heavenly Father, He knows what we need and He'll take care of us. So if I was going to sum up this whole thing, I'd say it like this. Well, this is what contentment is. Contentment is the conviction. The conviction is the firm belief that since God is for me, I can trust he will provide. I don't have a girlfriend or boyfriend yet. And I believe that maybe sex before marriage is wrong. I know that's what God tells me, but since everyone else is doing it and I won't have a boyfriend or girlfriend, I, I need to not trust God. I'm just going to do my own thing. Man, people in my, in, my, in my division at work, man, they're breaking the rules and, and I need to succeed. I need to look good like them. And I know that God calls me to like be faithful and be honest and, and to obey the rules. But if I don't get promoted, I might not make my bills. And so I'm not going to trust God. I'm, I'm going to take a shortcut. See, contentment is the conviction that since God is for me, I can trust you provide. And this allows me to be for others. See, when I realize that God will meet me and take care of me, I don't need to take from you. I don't need to walk over you. I don't need to hurt you. Since I know that God is for me and that he'll meet my needs, then I don't have to take a path that harms you. I don't have to see, want, stare, plot, and take. Instead, I can celebrate what God has done in your life and I can trust that he'll do what he wants to do in my life. If I was gonna sum up the whole, the whole message, you would go something like this and we're gonna put it up on the screen. Contentment leads to fulfillment while coveting leads to the dysfunctional cycle of consumption. The reality is, is that you and I will never ever experience fulfillment. Listen, you and I can't consume our way to happiness and fulfillment. It doesn't work. You've been trying it, I've been trying it, and we all know that it just doesn't lead. We'll always need. That's because we were made for something more than consumption. We were made for purpose. As I was thinking about how to close this up, um, I, I wanted to use movies and books and comics. Does anyone here like, I love movies. I'm a, anyone else like movies? Good. I love the second service and much more. Like in the first hand, it was like, in the first service, it was like two people. I was like, come on, you guys got to get out more often, right? Like I like comic books. I like books. Um, I like movies. I, I love kind of the new genre of movies where like there's the anti-hero or the villain is like a pained villain. Like they kind of portray the villain as someone that you might like. You can kind of understand why the villain is the way they are. You don't agree with them. You still think they're bad crazy, right? You're like, whoa, you shouldn't do that, right? Like Thanos from the Marvel, right? Like he's crazy, he wants to kill everyone, but you can understand, you can empathize and you can feel there's something about the new kind of stories that we kind of relate to the, to the, the, the villain and we can go, oh, I can see how they get there. They're still crazy. They shouldn't do that, but we can kind of relate to their story, right? And then there's the heroes and we really want to relate to them because that's what we want to be. We want to be the hero in our own story. And we love heroes that are willing to sap, sacrifice and step in to tough situations and to pay the cost to protect others. And so we go to movies, we go, yes, I want to be the hero and yes, I can understand the villain. But did you know in almost every kind of story, almost in every kind of movie, in every kind of comic book, there's always a third group of people. It's the people in the story that are the most like most of humanity. It's the people that are only there for themselves. They're the people that are unwilling to get involved in the conflict because it might have some personal cost. It's people who are exploiting other people during the situation who only care about what they're getting. And they're not willing to do anything unless they consume or they get. And here's what I know and here's what you know. When we read a book or a comic or watch a movie or see a play, none of us want to be that character. But that's exactly what coveting will lead to. Where it warps our thinking 
that consuming is how we find fulfillment in life. When the reality, Jesus tells us that fulfillment comes from a relationship and from purpose to which Jesus gives us both. Let me pray. Hey God, I know in my life there's been many times where I have crossed the line and I've, I've coveted. And God, I pray for me, I pray for anyone else here, God. You know, the most amazing thing is there's no sin that the blood of Jesus can't forgive. And so God, wherever we've messed up, we just say we're sorry. And we know that you love us and that you accept us not because we're good enough or because we earned it or we showed up here today, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. God, I pray for any of us stuck in the addiction of consuming God. God, that you by your Holy Spirit, you would pour something inside of us of yourself, God, where we would say no to our addiction and yes to the adventure, yes to following you, that there's something better than consuming, that we can contribute and that you've given us purpose and destiny. And that we can be content and we can know that if you would die for us, that you are for us and that you will meet our needs. God, wherever we've missed it, God, we ask for your forgiveness. God, we ask that you give us strength and wisdom and grace, God, to make you smile. Because Jesus, you didn't die just to get us to heaven. You conquered hell and death so that we could fulfill our purpose and have a life worth living forever. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.